First, I'm very thankful and grateful to be here today, as this will be the last conference I think I'll be giving this year, as I'm moving back to Spain in December. And I just want to thank everyone here at the UFM that have made me feel at home, colleagues, friends, other professors, um, the deans, and most of the team, the UFM, the presidency, all of that, have been very, very grateful for all of the help and the good times. And special thanks to the students who have made my three years here extremely interesting. When I left my job in Inditex, I, I left, and in the final interview, they were asking me, what do you want to do? And I, and I said, I want to get paid to read. That's the job of a professor, right? So, you know, fight for your dreams. They're possible. You can get them if you do it, if you push hard enough. Now, I'm aware of the difficulty that I have here today for many reasons. One of them is because I'm explaining the monarchy to a republic, which is a difficulty, of course, it always is. Also, because explaining the monarchy in a republican age is even more difficult, I find. And so to start with, I was uh, bouncing around some ideas with some friends saying, what are the typical cliches we hear against monarchies, right? What can you find in history books and that kind of stuff? Well, you know me, that's obviously uh, Xerxes about, about to invade the Greeks, looking over the Hellespont in what today is Turkey. One of the first things people say against the idea of a monarchy, at least in old times, is this problem of a strong man. If you follow some of the sociological theories of the formation of the state, you hear of these ideas of state as a conquest, of a chieftain, of a warlord, or whatever it is. But it's the rule imposed by a military victory, a rule imposed by the strong. Evidently, the legitimacy based on violence is terrible, and since antiquity, it has been viewed and doubted as such. Another one is the problem of uh, dispersed knowledge. We're in Hayek's auditorium here. And of course, one of the great problems when we talk about those great lawgivers of antiquity like Lycurgus in Sparta, Solon in Athens and many other places is, what are these guys? Are they like super intelligent, creating the most intelligent legislation? How can they know what's best for a society, right? Indeed, one could say this is the same problem we have with parliaments today. Another one of the classical one is a problem of divine right. Nobody hopefully nobody here, but I don't know, still believes that monarchs are there selected by God. But at least since the early times in the medieval period, after the collapse of Rome, divine right has been one of the key sources and legitimacy of kings throughout the centuries. Now, 16th, 17th century onward, this is going to be debated, of course, and nobody believes in this today, so of course this could never be None of these could be a case for defense. Another of the great problems is despotism, which comes from the Greek word despotes, which reflects a relationship between a master and a slave. When the Greeks looked at Xerxes, which you're seeing here, they looked at a barbarian civilization. They thought they were a barbarian civilization because the relationship between the ruler and the ruled was that of a master-slave relationship. There wasn't any concepts like citizenship or free men. You couldn't be free under the despot. And I would say that if you look at some of the series that we find in Netflix, HBO, and all these places, and you look at the French court during the moments of absolutism, you see a lot of people very painted with makeup and very weird garments, and it all looks like luxury and corruption and all of these ideas that we have of the absolute monarchs. So that's still there. Another great problem is, of course, how the transfer of power works. We, we, we used to live in an age in which we were supporting meritocracy and a right of everyone to pursue through their own efforts their pursuit of happiness. This is being challenged now, of course. But indeed, it's still very shocking to see that you can receive the title and the crown just because you're the son or daughter of a king. Today, in an age in which equality is the rage of everyone, everyone's raging about equality, that's everybody, everything everybody is talking about constantly, 
and we're going to very wild extremes in all of that, looking at an institution like the crown, that it, it is based on an inequality of the royal family versus the rest of society in one sense, but also on how you get to be king. Also, this is one of the oldest one in the bag. What to do with a bad king? Indeed, what can we do with a monarch that might be in power for 40, 50 years? That can be a terrible thing for a kingdom. And lastly, how do we choose them today? So say that tomorrow we embarked on a journey and we went to an island in the middle of the Pacific. And we decided, because I convinced you today that monarchy, a constitutional monarchy is a good idea, that we need to set up a monarchy. How do we decide who's the king? That's extremely difficult. The reason why we think it's this a weird thing to do is because during the medieval period also, most of the kings in some of the traditions were selected by peers, by other lords. They were one of the lords that was selected by the rest to defend the kingdom in a given moment, and then led, that led into a dynasty, right? But then it is forgotten the moment in which a family first arrives in the throne. And in many places, like in England, this is still a very touchy issue. What happened in the Glorious Revolution and the difficult decades before that, that's in 1688, it's still a matter of great controversy. Who is the legitimate family? What does the bloodline say? So, so what, right? Um, these are all interesting things I'm saying. But why should we care today about if monarchy is an interesting institution or if it isn't? Um, before I get into that, I don't know if anyone's watching this. I am. Um, I need to talk about the problem of power. The great Western civilization has, as some authors have said, two legs, two very strong legs, not like mine more like Danny's, um, that have been there since a very long time. One leg would be the Greek and the Roman tradition. The other one would be the Judeo-Christian tradition. And in both traditions, there is a concept of the dark side of human nature. Aristotle said this very eloquently, saying that man could be the most savage of beasts if he wants to. So did Sophocles in many of his plays. In the Christian tradition, and here I'm following the readings of Michael Oakeshott, it is the myth of the Western civilization is the fall. Adam and Eve, you might have heard of them. If you're a Westerner, you've heard of them. That is a fact. Michael Oakeshott thought during his works and reading The Leviathan and other important political works that this was the myth of the West. This concept of the fall. Now, for the early church fathers, like St. Irenaeus, government was a gift of God because we had gone to hell, being so barbaric, basically. For St. Augustine, it was barbaric that men should rule men, that rational creatures, partly divine creatures, should be ruling over other men was something terrible. The only possible explanation, he found that, this is an anarch, it, this is a, it looks like a defense for anarchy, right? The only possible interpretation he found is that it, it was because of pride and our fall and sin that men needed governments. Because we rob, because we steal, because we do terrible things like war into one another. So whatever you want to call it, I don't want to discuss if this should be public or private. That's more for more modern readers to see. The monopoly and the use and regulation of violence has been extremely important in legitimizing kingship from the beginning. So what I'm going to be doing here today, and if you take only one idea of everything I'm going to be saying here today, is the following one. I will be defending the constitutional monarchy using republican terms. Yes, it sounds like a contradiction, but because we know that power is a terrible thing, here you have Lord Sauron over a mass of ignorant orcs. Because we know it's such a terrible thing, 
we managed to divide it. If you follow Montesquieu in his Spirit of the Laws, you have the three famous separations of executive, legislative, and judiciary. Well, I want you to think of the constitutional monarchy as an added division of power. That is the defense of the monarchy on a utilitarian terms, but using Republican ideas of the division of powers. Let's look into something else. When former president Teddy Roosevelt visited Emperor Franz Joseph in 1910, he asked him the same question the center Henry Hasley asked me, right? What is the role of a monarchy in the 21st century? Although, of course, that was the 20th, not the 21st. Look at the answer. He said, the king said to the American president, to protect my peoples from their governments. It is hard to explain better in what way he saw himself as a further division of powers than that. This is the Democracy Index developed by the Economist Intelligence Unit. This is the 2021 issue. And what you're viewing here, I might get out of the way, is the 20 most advanced democracies in the world. Now, a monarchy sounds something old and corrupted, doesn't it? Well, let's look at how many of these are monarchies. Out of the 20 most advanced democracies in the world, 10 are constitutional monarchies. And out of the five most advanced, three are. It is evident that most of these societies, which are some of the best places and most free places to live in the world, have found something useful in maintaining a monarch, evidently under a constitution. This, that sounds puzzling to a modern generation, was not puzzling to Benjamin Constant the French thinker who was extremely influential in the decades following the French Revolution. Constant thought that because of the terrible excesses of the French Revolution and the danger that, a, that an enraged mass can have on society, that a constitutional monarch was extremely important in maintaining peace, order, and freedom. He said that throughout his life, he said, I have defended the same principles, freedom in everything, religious freedom, re freedom in philosophy, in literature, in industry, and of course, in politics. But what did he understand by freedom? By freedom, I mean the triumph of individuality. This, he said, in one of his most famous works, which I'll be talking about a bit later, is the characteristic of modern freedom. When we talk about freedom in modern times, we mean this capacity, this triumph of the individuality over the despotic rule of one, as it's been decades of history, but also, and more interesting, over the despotism of the masses that want the right to enslave a minority in the name of a majority. Monarchy then for him is useful because it's a neutral power. Now, it's not a passive power, because a passive power is a contradiction in terms, but it's a neutral power, and when he says, and excuse my French, droit d'empêcher versus droit de faire, which means it is a right to block versus a right to do. Saying, the new king must not be proposing new legislation just deciding what's best for society, but he must stop the bad ideas coming out of assemblies, basically. He must be able to block if a majority wants to, wants to be a tyrant on a minority, be that the rich, the poor, the Jews, whatever you want to call it. This is something which preoccupied very much the classical liberals at the beginning of the 19th century. A president in a Republican system, and here think of someone like Donald Trump, or Joe Biden, a president in a Republican system would be partisan, not a king. And hence, it would, be, it would unify the nation in moments of crisis when nothing else could. Because if the head of state is a president, 
in moments of great crisis leading up to a civil war, for example, there is no symbol to unify a society around. Is this then polarization, one of the most used words I'd say in the last 20 years in, in uh, political theory and political science generally? This is a great remedy to political polarization. This is uh, Constant's important work edited by a visiting professor of ours called Angel Rivero. He was here a couple of weeks ago. And by the way, much of the stuff I'm saying about Constant and that I'll be saying about Badgett is thanks to Angel Rivero and also to Catherine Marshall, professor of British studies. Now, this is a very small book. I actually gave it to Danny. He's got it there in his hand. Uh, it's more like a, it's not really, a, it's this thing. You see, it's quite easy to read. But there are great ideas here, thank you. Very important. He says, some classical liberals have defended the monarchy using the English experiment as a model. The English have taught the world that by giving more freedom to individuals, we can achieve more progress. This is achieved by an atmosphere of social stability and peace in which the monarchy plays an essential role. Absolutism for Constant was what happens when the king interferes in other of the powers. A constitutional monarch may not do that, although we'll debate a bit about that at the end. What else did our dear French friend say? The monarch is above society. This is why he's neutral. His only interests must be the maintenance of order and freedom. And this is what's very important because this is the fact that most anger peoples in modernity. Everybody gets angered because he's above society in a way, but it's precisely because he is above society that he's able to be neutral. He will not share the passions and ambitions for power and status that politicians will have. So here's the magic then for Constant. This is an example of the King of Spain during the Catalonian crisis in which political leaders to the left and right dared not say anything. The king stepped up on television and gave a unifying address in a moment of great crisis in Spain. He could do this precisely because he was above party politics. A monarch arrives to the throne of his ancestors following a path not chosen by him. He's not an ambitious leader like Napoleon, He's not giving a coup d'etat or anything like that. He knows since he's 12 that he's going to be the king. He's trained and educated since he's very young that he's going to be the king. That is why I don't really envy the kings myself, but I know not everybody shares this with me. Jaeger says he has no further political opportunities or ambitions except to do his job well and maintain the good name of his dynasty. Standing neutral above party politics, he has a better chance than an elected leader of becoming the personified symbol of his country, a focus of patriotism and even of affection. Speaking of affection, I suppose you're all well aware of how affection, the affection that Queen Elizabeth, the late Queen Elizabeth II had with most people. Some of my students also, I saw. Everyone was sharing stories on Instagram the day she passed away. How can she do that? You know? How can she create that affection for people that are not even her subjects, in a way? To understand that, there is a classical work when thinking of monarchy in the English system by Walter Badgett. You might know Walter Badgett by his work in banking, and in The Economist, he was one of the most important innovators inside The Economist. And indeed today, you still find a section in The Economist under his name uh, dedicated to the great English and British culture and events and stuff like that. Walter Badgett wrote the English Constitution in 1867. The same time, the French are under the Emperor Napoleon III. Uh, the Ameri North Americans are under much trouble. And he dedicates two chapters, which you can read in an hour, very two short chapters, quite easy to understand. And in them, he divides the British Constitution into two. 
He says, the English system works with two types of institutions. One is the institutions of dignity, that is the monarch and the house of lords. This arouses the respect of the population. The other is the institutions of efficiency, the House of Commons and the Cabinet, of course, the Prime Minister. These are the real powers, where legislation and the great debates happen, then it might be ratified or not by the House of Lords, but the real power by when Badgett is writing is already in the efficient powers. So what is the use, we might ask ourselves, of the institutions of dignity? According to Badgett, and he's more of a Republican in this way, monarchies are a useful power for an ignorant population, but as people become more educated, or so he thought, the role of the monarchy would gradually disappear into a republic. Indeed, if one looks at the history of England, you could say that that's what's been happening for the last 500 years. The tensions between the king and the parliaments have always been... Constantly, as centuries goes by, the parliament has been assuming more, more and more powers, right? The monarch is the head, and this is extremely important, of the British society, not the state, he says, in the eyes of the people. Whereas the French emperor is not the head of the state, he is the state. Or if we might quote another French king way before that, l'état est moi, I am the state. He's also, and this happens in the English system, not in other places, the defender of the faith of the Anglican Church, as you know, and as such, must be a model of morality. Please don't feel insulted, all of the women who are reading this. The woman, one half of the human race, at least care 50 times more for a marriage than a ministry. And I would say they're not just women, mostly Anybody would prefer to see what's going on in a wedding than what a labor department is deciding in a law a Tuesday afternoon. Why? This is the myth, the image of the monarchy that is so important. I have a, a Spanish friend called Jose Ruiz who wrote an article on the monarchy a couple of years back and he said a quote that I like very much. He said, it's important that a, a king sees himself in his society and that his society see themselves in him. When we have all of these celebrations, all of these great events of the royal family, funerals, weddings, coronations, people feel identified with the monarch in a way they'd never do with politicians. This creates a politics of and an attitude of deference, as Catherine Marshall has called it. And if you ask Badgett what the difference between a republic and a monarchy would be, he would tell you this. He would say, a monarchy is a system in which one person does very interesting things, like he gets married, he dies, there's a lot of problems in the family. And a republic is a system in which many people do many uninteresting things. So long. As the human heart is strong and the human reason weak, royalty will be strong because it appeals to diffuse feeling and republics weak because they appeal to understanding. I will be debating this point at the end of the presentation. Constitutional royalty, he says, acts as a disguise. It enables our real rulers to change without a heedless people knowing it. This is Margaret Thatcher and our queen. Even Margaret Thatcher kneeled. What a, the Iron Lady kneeled. What powers should then a constitutional monarch have, according to Badgett? Three powers. The right to be consulted, the right to encourage, and the right to warn. What this means is that when the prime minister and the cabinet has the obligation to inform the king or queen of what's going on in the country, what they're debating, what the policy is going to do, and the queen has the right, they're consulting her there, right? She has the right to be consulted. And she can encourage or warn if she thinks those are good or bad ideas. She can't do more. 
And what's extremely interesting is the quote that follows this. Badgett says, A king of great sense and sagacity would want no other. If you're able to use these three powers very well, you would want no other. Why is a monarch the best for such powers? Experience with multiple governments and failed policies. Badgett says, he might not turn the prime minister's course. The, the prime minister, the government has decided to do something, they're going to do it. They're just telling the king or the queen they're going to do it. But he would always trouble his mind. He'd have to think twice about developing legislation and policies, right? Political appointees that work for the cabinet or the prime ministers are there in are the prime minister's inferiors. They could not warn the prime minister of a bad idea with the same force that a king or queen could. And Badgett says, no one can argue on their knees. Right? What you're seeing here is Boris Johnson and our late queen. See what he's doing there? Imagine trying to argue why this is a good policy in that position. It's hard to do. Yes? This is what Badgett is referring to. Even if he's not very bright, we might have a not very intelligent king. But even then, in the long run, he will be neither too clever or too stupid. He would just be a simple, common man who plods the plain routine of life from cradle to the grave. And what you're looking at there is all of the prime ministers that Elizabeth lived with. Fifteen prime ministers, starting with the great Winston Churchill here at the beginning. Just imagine being a young queen and having him as a prime minister. You've probably seen the crown, most of you, and seen that relationship one way or another. So that's his argument, basically. Now, there are some questions, of course, and many problems that I said at the beginning that Benjamin Constant or that Badgett do not really answer. Some of them are the following. Badgett leaves a door open for an active king who would wield power. If you are a very intelligent, formed and educated king in policy with your own ideology, because kings and queens are people like us, then it is very tempting to use that power. Indeed, what's extremely interesting of Badgett's work is that he was mistaken. He wrote this book at the moment when Queen Victoria, which is extremely important in the 19th century in England, was coming in. And he described these powers as if Queen, Queen Victoria only had those powers. Now, the publication of Queen Victoria's letters would have to wait a couple of more decades. Not until 1910, 1915, do we have the publication of her letters. But now we know that Queen Victoria was very conservative, great friend with Disraeli, and, again, very active in politics. But what's fascinating is how this book changed history. Why did it change history? Because even if Badgett was mistaken when he wrote it, the father of Queen Elizabeth II, our former queen, and Elizabeth II were educated into the principles of this book. So something that started as Badgett thinking what the ideal of monarchy should be, was transformed into a reality with Elizabeth II because she lived throughout all her life trying to follow these principles with more or less success, right? So did our current, so did our current king, by the way, read most of these texts. Now, here's a problem that I find with Badgett. He's still sharing what I call uh, the father of John Stuart Mill represented the dream of the Enlightenment with a quote that I like very much. He said that once humanity could read and write, most of the evils of the world poof, would disappear. Wouldn't that be nice? No, indeed. It didn't happen. So Badgett has this idea that a monarchy only makes sense for an ignorant people. But as you've seen today, Half of the 20 most advanced democracies in the world still have monarchies. And out of the top five, they hold a majority. These are the most advanced, some of the most advanced societies in the world in any of the ways you want to look at them. 
And they are all very literate. They can read and write. Which means that maybe Badgett underestimated his own theory in thinking that only an ignorant people live by myth. Another great problem, of course, is exemplary morality possible? In the end, I don't believe in the divine right of kings, of course. I know they're only people, they're only human, with their darker and their brighter side. Can they really be exemplary? Can we have saints as kings? Evidently, no. And let's be honest about it. We need to face that fact. That's not true. And before the age of mass television, social media, and the digital age, it was easier to conceal the vices of the monarchy, of a monarch. Today, that is becoming harder and harder. And of course, back to the, one of the first questions I asked at the beginning of this. Even if we thought that this was a great idea, because today, I think, realistically, the only thing we can do is celebrate in those places where it still works. But I think it's extremely hard to start a monarchy from zero today in an age of equality, right? And the question is, I was talking with Olaf of his own country and uh, with Jesus Maria and Danny before about the experiments in the Americas with these two, right? Failed experiments, mostly. So that's an extremely tough nut to crack. If a monarchy is not possible, how to hold a genuinely diverse society together? I know the word imperialism sounds like a boogeyman today, but most of the old empires were some of the most tolerant in many other ways. Many emperors were able to hold multi-ethnic with different religions, different colors of skin, toleration in so many issues, because a diverse society could see themselves in the king or queen. And here, I end with one of Bajadet's quotes. Well, I don't end here. I'm, I'm about to end. He says, it's a mystery of life, the monarchy. We must not let daylight upon magic. Isn't that a beautiful way of putting it? The more you rationalize it, the more danger you have of destroying it, is basically what he's saying there. I just want to leave you with some words of our former queen. In 1957, this was the first time Christmas Day was broadcasted. Now, this was like a seven-minute speech, eight minutes. I just cut it down because we don't have that much time today. But I think her words represent extremely well what I've been explaining here today. The, how the new monarchs see themselves and their roles in this new era. Now, this is 1957, but things haven't changed that much, I would say, with Elizabeth. But I'll leave you to your own opinions there. Let's see it. In the old days, the monarch led his soldiers on the battlefield, and his leadership at all times was close and personal. Today, things are very different. I cannot lead you into battle. I do not give you laws or administer justice. But I can do something else. I can give you my heart and my devotion to these old islands and to all the peoples of our brotherhood of nations. Thank you very much.